Lovely. So, it, again, it's a pleasure to be here this morning and to talk to you um, about the ESA Space Science Program um, and also very briefly about the Robotic Exploration Program which we have, which we've taken on in ESA in the last uh, couple of years, uh, fundamentally oriented at looking at Mars uh, in collaboration with our NASA colleagues. I also want to spend some time at the end um, beyond looking at the current missions that we have and the ones we are implementing today, looking at the so-called Cosmic Vision Program, which is our program for future space science in the time frame 2015 to 2025. So let me start by giving you a little historical look at where the ESA, and in fact, historically, the ESRO space science program has been um, since it started in the 1960s. And what you can see here is that there was a fairly much a plateau, if you like, of missions through to the mid-1990s until about 2000 when the space science program in Europe took off, um, literally. And we're, as of last year, actually, at an all-time high. In fact, this year, we're slightly, we're one mission down because Ulysses, after 18 years of operation, uh, was turned off last year. Uh, it, it ran out of power. There wasn't enough data coming back. So you can see we're here, which is a very good place to be as a space scientist. You can also see that perhaps falling off the edge of this cliff um, is perhaps not a fortunate place to be, but there's a very simple reason for that. And that is that our missions run on, uh, on fixed budgets, of course, and on fixed timescales, and we look every two years to extend our missions. And you can see that we have a large number of missions currently operating and have been operating for many years, but we will be looking again at the end of this year to extend those. Um, they're still all operational. They, should, they still all have enough... Uh, of, um, fuel and uh, lifetime on their batteries to keep going. Um, a couple of them, of course, and I'm going to talk about those in a moment, Herschel and Planck, are cryogenic missions and fundamentally will run out um, in a couple of years' time. You can also see at the top here the missions which we're currently implementing, and I'll go through those in a little bit of detail. Just to put n names, if those are not all e easily readable, uh, these are the current missions which we're operating on the, uh, let's see, for you, the left-hand side, these are the ones which we lead, and these are the ones which we uh, do in collaboration, many with NASA, but also with uh, our Japanese colleagues and our Chinese colleagues and with France here. So again, uh, a fairly broad uh, palette, and this is an astronomy audience, so I will talk mostly about the astronomy missions, in particular in the cosmic vision context, but I will show you a few results from some of our planetary missions, and it's now my job to look after the, the science from those missions as well, uh, which is why I'll put them in. Now, I'll go very quickly through the, the ones you know very well. Hubble, everybody knows Hubble, uh, and of course it's now effectively a completely new telescope uh, in many ways as of last uh, spring when the uh, last refurbishing, refurbishment mission took place, Widefield Camera 3 and uh, COS and uh, the uh, uh, repair of uh, ACS has put this back really in a very powerful place. and it's now looking to last until 2017-18 and therefore overlapping significantly with James Webb Space Telescope, which is coming on before that. We have two high energy missions, which will be talked about later in the week. There's a plenary talk, I think, by Steve Murray tomorrow on uh, both Chandra and XMM Newton, which have been operating for a decade now, very successfully and integral as well. Our gamma ray mission has been running since 2002, and uh, there are some talks on that, I believe, in this meeting as well. The new children that we have, which we're very proud of, uh, of course, and you'll hear much more about um, Herschel, at least, uh, later on this afternoon, is, uh, is the Herschel Space Observatory here, and also Planck, which I'll come to in a moment. Both were launched on a single Ariane 5 uh, last May, uh, and were historically referred to as the Herschel-Planck mission. They were developed together, launched on the same observatory, uh, on the same uh, uh, rocket, but we now very much talk about them separately, although they orbit the L2, uh, Sun-Earth L2 point um, uh, out at a million and a half kilometers away from the Sun, uh, from the Earth. You'll hear much more about Herschel, so I'm just going to show you some of the pretty pictures. I think Herschel has surprised many people. A lot of, uh, some of my short wavelength colleagues, let's call them, said, you know, Herschel has the resolution of a barn door um, being only a three and a half meter telescope, the biggest uh, astronomical telescope in space, but operating at very long wavelengths. On the other hand, Herschel is extremely sensitive and gets confusion limited, so to speak, very, very quickly and can map very large areas of the sky. So it can indeed produce very large panoramic images uh, of the inner galaxy, as you see here, star forming regions, 
um, and also, as you'll see in a moment, of extragalactic sky. What's also very interesting about Herschel, I think, um, is why the images are so pretty. And it's because Herschel operates across a black body curve, much as Hubble does. Hubble operates uh, to the short and the long wavelength side of the, v of the black body curve for stars. Herschel does it for dust. And so you get a very broad range of colors in the images. And of course, those colors are astrophysically diagnostic of uh, warm and uh, colder dust at uh, far infrared and submillimeter wavelengths. So you'll hear more about that from Euron Pilbrat, the project scientist for Herschel, um, after the coffee break. And there's a session this afternoon where you hear from all of the PIs uh, of that mission. Uh, this is another one which, uh, again, demonstrates just the, 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 the huge leap that Herschel has made. This is a very small part of a very large survey being conducted by Herschel in the extragalactic sky. And all of these little points are submillimeter galaxies. Uh, Avena showed you a smaller piece of that. And this is now just expanding over huge areas of the sky and producing enormous numbers of objects at a very large range of redshifts. And there are a lot of papers which have been published on this and other science areas from Herschel in an ast astronomy and astrophysics special edition, which just came out, uh, I think, uh, a few weeks ago. Or will come out. The papers, I think, have been finalized now. So there's a huge amount of science from Herschel, uh, which is already uh, on the streets. And the last result I want to show you from Herschel, and this, again, goes back to Avina's talk, is the, uh, the third instrument. We have Spire and Pax, which are images and spectrometers, and then Hi-Fi, um, which is a high-resolution heterodyne spectro uh, spectrometer. And you can see here, again, a little piece of the spectrum of Orion, as Avina showed, and you can see the identification of some of the lines in there. Um, Hi-Fi, as many of you know, had a problem for a few months. Uh, it had a, a, um, an SEU, a single event uh, uh, upset, which uh, turned the, uh, made the electronics um, go into a mode which they weren't intended for, and the whole system shut down. After a few months, we figured out what went wrong and have turned the redundant electronics on, and it works very well now. So all three instruments are operating at full speed, and Euron will tell you more about all of that after the coffee break. Same time, May last year, we launched Planck. Uh, and Planck is a cosmic microwave background experiment uh, with higher resolution and higher sensitivity than WMAP. One we very rapidly made a release of a small part of the sky as uh, Planck rotates around and scans the sky, over uh, the whole sky, over a six-month period. Uh, I would love to be able to show you the all-sky image, but I can't. Um, what I can show you is a piece which we released uh, a couple of months ago now of the intergalactic plane. So this is all dust seen at the uh, highest frequencies of Planck. And this is a Fucus, the star forming region of Fucus, the galactic plane here. This is all the stuff, of course, which is uh, science to some of the people involved in Planck and noise to many of the others. So this is all the stuff we have to get rid of uh, in order to be able to see the CMB properly. As I say, I would love to be able to show you the first all sky image, but you'll have to wait until next week. We will release it on the 5th of July. Um, it's an image which shows you the galactic foreground and some peaks of the CMB. Of course, we don't want to give away the science. If we showed you the full CMB image, you could go in with a ruler and start measuring the distance between all the peaks and uh, publish a paper. Um, unfortunately, with this extended proprietary period, as many of you involved in the CMB know, it takes a long time to beat down the systematics and calibrate the system properly. So we will be showing a very pretty picture. And it is on this laptop, but I shall be holding on to this for the rest of the day um, of the whole sky with the foreground and some of the CMB peeking through. So look out for that next week. It really is quite spectacular. We also have missions which uh, operate in the solar system, of course. Cluster, which is uh, four spacecraft flying in, in formation through the Earth's magnetosphere. And SOHO, which is sitting at the uh, Sun-Earth L1 point which is looking at the sun 24 hours a day. And these two missions, of course, are looking at the connection between the sun, solar activity, and how that impinges on the Earth, so-called Sun-Earth connection. And that extends in ESA well beyond uh, just the space science program that extends to space weather and to the Earth observation program, as you may expect. Moving a little further away, we have uh, missions in orbit around two of the uh, nearest planets, so Venus Express, uh, is, uh, has been there since 2005 in orbit around Venus, and a very interesting science result which was uh, recently published by Sue Smecker and her colleagues using both uh, infrared imaging, Virtus data from Venus Express, and archival Magellan altimetry data 
which is the orange in the background, and this is the vertice data superimposed on top of that, shows that uh, on top of a few of these large uh, peaks, mountains, let's say, there is evidence for high emissivity, and that high emissivity is fresh material, which has been relatively recently deposited uh, on the order of a, f a few tens or 100,000 years, and there's evidence, held to be evidence for recent volcanism, that Venus is perhaps still volcanically active today, which is a very interesting new science result. Mars Express has been in orbit around Mars for a number of years. Um, this image is usually showed the other way up, but uh, now I've become involved in the space game, I thought it just doesn't really matter which way I show it, right? So. And a very interesting uh, release which we had, it's not science particularly, but really is, is something we all have to think about in the space game a lot as well, is public outreach. This uses the visual monitoring camera on Mars Express, which was actually used, it's a little webcam simply put on board to check that Beagle 2 separated from Mars Express. That much it did, of course, where it went after that is another question. Um, but this shows a full orbit of Mars Express around Mars, and you'll see Phobos go past in a second. Flicker through the image. There it goes. So, again, just a minute, uh, a picture taken every minute as Mars Express orbited around Mars, giving a, a little bit of a view for what it would be like to be there in orbit. And one of the, if the sleeper missions, if you like, very literally, uh, we have in the space program is Rosetta. Rosetta's on its way out to a comet with an unpronounceable name in the outer solar system, rendezvousing in 2014. It's already played a game of billiards going around the inner solar system several times with flybys past the Earth and past Venus. Um, and a very interesting um, event which will be taking place uh, in about 10 days' time is that Rosetta will be flying by an asteroid, asteroid Lutetia, um, fairly fast but fairly close and providing some very uh, high-resolution images of this very interesting, it turns out to be a very interesting uh, asteroid with very contradictory types. It's got a, a mixed C-type and M-type uh, surface, so we're not really quite sure what kind of an asteroid it is, but we will find out in 10 days' time. So, let's look at our future space missions. We have a whole number which we're uh, studying and implementing. These are the ones which we're building, and I'll show you some, some pictures from those in a moment. Lisa Pathfinder, which is a mission uh, to test out technologies for a fundamental physics mission called LISA, which may well come in the future uh, to detect gravitational waves. Gaia, which is a high-precision astrometry mission. JWST, of course, you should all know about JWST, and there was a, a session devoted to that on, on Sunday. And Bepi Colombo, our uh, joint mission with uh, JAXA to Mercury. I'm going to say just a very small amount about the robotic exploration program because, again, as I said at the beginning, we picked this up a couple of years ago um, from another directorate in ESA uh, to now work with NASA on a joint program. It's called ExoMars in ESA, um, but it's now a joint program in all of its phases, and that will involve a trace gas orbiter um, which will go and uh, orbit Mars in 2016 and acts as the data relay for the missions which we will then land later on. And it also has a demonstrator uh, entry, descent, and landing system. And then in 2018, we'll fly two rovers onto the surface of Mars, both under the NASA sky crane, which will be used for Mars Science Lab in 2012, but we'll put two uh, rovers down on the same location. The ExoMars rover, which will be devoted more to pr digging down to two meters deep and pulling out potential samples of uh, of life-bearing molecules or perhaps even remnant life uh, from earlier in the uh, life of uh, Mars. And then the NASA rover, at the moment, the architecture looks like it'll actually be practicing caching, collecting material together, putting it into little containers to be then returned in a sample return mission, perhaps as early as 2025. And then I'll say a little bit about our cosmic vision missions one at a time. Uh, the medium missions which are under study, Solar Orbiter, Euclid, Plato, and Speaker, and then the large missions, ICSO, LISA, and EJSM. And I'll, of course, explain what all those acronyms are in a moment. So again, just to show you the, 